Good morning, church, and welcome to Nathan's Notes here on this Friday morning. We're going to come out of the book of Matthew this morning, the 14th chapter, beginning in verse 13 through verse 21. And it says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them over here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides the women and children. And then from our devotional, the Feasting on the Word, and this is from Clifton Kirkpatrick. It says, The promise of the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is that if we join together in unity and faithfulness, God will be with us. It is not a promise of the absence of struggle and pain. Jesus even had to go the way of the cross. But a promise that God will be with us and that God's intention for love, peace, and justice in the world will ultimately prevail. So the, re the question that Clifton leads us with is, what stories can you recall of people of faith joining together in unity and in faithfulness? And this is another one where I've got a bunch of stories that I could link to. So, when I think of unity and faithfulness, I often think of, uh, I mean, there's many different places I can think of, but when I was uh, a teenager attending Jarrett Memorial, when I first started there, the church was really struggling. Well, when I first started there. <laughs> That's a catchphrase I'm too used to. From most of my memory there, the, first, the church was struggling. I mean, attendances in the 15 and the 20s was, was really good. And when I was in high school, the church saw a growth spurt. And we were up into the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And I, I can remember that for the first time, you know, there weren't a whole lot of empty pews. And for the first time, there was a youth group besides like me and one other person. And it was interesting to see a struggling, dying church transform into something that was alive all of a sudden. And what brought about the most transformation was that the church started working together to reach out into the community, to love the community and the neighbors, and to help people. And, I mean, we, we had, we did meals uh, to raise money to help support people. We did, I mean, we did car washes and things so that, like, if the, the youth group went on a trip, everybody got to go. go. It didn't, you know, you didn't have to worry about whether or not you could pay for it or not. And it was just... It, the church worked so that everybody would be included, regardless, regardless period. You know, there, there was no exclusion. And when the church focused on making sure everybody was included, they exploded in growth. When everybody that walked through that door was loved, whether they knew you or not, the church exploded in growth. And what really brought about that foundation of growth was that the church really began focusing on studying the Bible and applying it to their lives. So it wasn't just about how many, I mean, I can remember growing up, we, we had, uh, we called them sword drills, and it was where somebody would say, like, um, Luke 5, verse 22, and the, the first person that could get there won, and we had, uh, I can remember we'd have these, you know, vacation Bible schools and things like that, but... Uh, we had other things going on, like in our youth group, and we had memory verses, and 
you know, you had to memorize the verse that week. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But it goes beyond just memorizing Scripture. The Christian faith does. It's not just memorizing it. Yeah, you're supposed to know it. And if you're blessed with a mind that can memorize things, then go for it. But it's taking that Scripture and applying it to your life. And when we really did that, when we started loving people like Christ loved them, and when we started, you know, not excluding people for whatever reasons, when it really, when we really started loving and acting like Christians, like Christians literally mean like little Christs, that it just exploded. And that sounds too simple. But sometimes I think we can get so caught up in going through the motions of church that we can forget that, you know, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love our community, that this church doesn't just exist for us to have something to do on Sunday mornings, that it exists so that we can come together and, and grow together in God and love on one another and strengthen one another and then go out into this community and do that. Love on them and strengthen them and help them and, and, and love them like Christ did. So today, as we, you know, today's Friday, we've got Friday and then Saturday and then Sunday. I want you to be actively praying about this. And not just for two days, but keep, keep it going for quite a while. What can Madison be doing to, to reach out into this community, not with the goal of just making sure they come to church here, which that's an awesome goal. We always want to see our, our brothers and sisters come and worship with us. But what can we do to really bless our community? What can we do here that will change people's lives for the better? Whether we ever see them in church on Sunday or not, what can we do that will have this community going? God's doing some amazing things at that church. You should go find out what it is. I know the Spirit's been prompting me on a few things that I'm still trying to decipher. But if it's real, and it's not just something that I think we should be doing, then the Spirit should also be prompting others in this congregation as well. So as I'm, I'm, I'm going to close this in prayer, but I want to encourage you to keep praying about this for the, ne for the next, let's just say for the rest of this month, and then we might talk some more about it. What is God calling us to do here in Madison and Danville? What is... Madison United Methodist purpose here. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you. And I pray, Lord, that you bless this church with a clear purpose. And I pray that clear purpose is echoed in the voices of the congregation here, that we can follow the, the, the line that you are drawing for us, the path that you are following, drawing for us. I pray that you use this church to change lives for the better, that lives are completely changed here. Father, I pray that in your spirit you speak to us and you guide us in this. And I pray your blessings and your favor on your people today. Thank you, God. And we lift this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And amen. Bless you, church.